A colistron is a specialized linear beam vacuum tube, invented in 1937 by American electrical engineers Russell and Sigurd Varian, which is used as an amplifier for high radio frequencies, from UHF up into the microwave range. Low-power colistrons are used as oscillators in terrestrial microwave relay communications links, while high-power colistrons are used as output tubes in UHF television transmitters, satellite communication, and radar transmitters, and to generate the drive power for modern particle accelerators. In the colistron, an electron beam interacts with the radio waves as it passes through resonant cavities, metal boxes along the length of the tube. The electron beam first passes through a cavity to which the input signal is applied. The energy of the electron beam amplifies the signal, and the amplified signal is taken from a cavity at the other end of the tube. The output signal can be coupled back into the input cavity to make an electronic oscillator to generate radio waves. The gain of colistrons can be high, 60 dB or more, with output power up to tens of megawatts, but the bandwidth is narrow usually a few percent although it can be up to 10 percent in some devices. A reflex colistron is an obsolete type in which the electron beam was reflected back along its path by a high potential electrode, used as an oscillator. The name colistron comes from the stem form iii florin of a Greek verb referring to the action of waves breaking against a shore, and the suffix iii one half meaning the place where the action happens. The name colistron was suggested by Hermann for our currency NKEL, a professor in the classics department at Stanford University when the colistron was under development. History The brothers Russell and Sigurd Varian of Stanford University are the inventors of the colistron. Their prototype was completed and demonstrated successfully on August 30, 1937. Upon publication in 1939, News of the colistron immediately influenced the work of U.S. and U.K. researchers working on radar equipment. The Varians went on to found Varian Associates to commercialize the technology. Their work built on the description of velocity modulation by A. R. S. N. G. A. Hale and Oscar Hale in 1935, though the Varians were probably unaware of the Hale's work. The work of physicist W. W. Hansen was instrumental in the development of the colistron and was cited by the Varian brothers in their 1939 paper. His resonator analysis, which dealt with the problem of accelerating electrons toward a target, could be used just as well to decelerate electrons. During the Second World War, Hansen lectured at the MIT Radiation Labs two days a week, commuting to Boston from Sperry Gyroscope Company on Long Island. His resonator was called a Wombatron by the Varian brothers. Hansen died of beryllium disease in 1949 as a result of exposure to beryllium oxide. During the Second World War, the Axis powers relied mostly on colistron technology for their radar system microwave generation, while the Allies used the far more powerful but frequency drifting technology of the cavity magnetron for much shorter 1 cm microwave generation. Colistron tube technologies for very high power applications, such as synchrotrons and radar systems, have since been developed. Right after WW2 AT&T used four watt colistrons in its brand new network of microwave links that covered the U.S. continent. The network provided long distance telephone service and also carried television signals for the major TV networks. Western Union Telegraph Company also built point-to-point -point microwave communication links using intermediate repeater stations at about 40-mile intervals at that time, using 2K25 reflex colistrons in both the transmitters and receivers. How it works Colistrons amplify RF signals by converting the kinetic energy in a DC electron beam into radio frequency power. A beam of electrons is produced by a thermionic cathode, and accelerated by high voltage electrodes. This beam is then passed through an input cavity resonator. RF energy is fed into the input cavity at, or near, its resonant frequency, creating standing waves, which produce an oscillating voltage which acts on the electron beam. The electric field causes the electrons to bunch electrons that pass through when the electric field opposes their motion are slowed while electrons which pass through when the electric field is in the same direction are accelerated, causing the previously continuous electron beam to form bunches at the input frequency. To reinforce the bunching, 
a colistron may contain additional bunchuk cavities. The beam then passes through a drift tube in which the faster electrons catch up to the slower ones, creating the bunches, then through a catcher cavity. In the output catcher cavity, each bunch enters the cavity at the time in the cycle when the electric field opposes the electron's motion, decelerating them. Thus the kinetic energy of the electrons is converted to potential energy of the field, increasing the amplitude of the oscillations. The oscillations excited in the catcher cavity are coupled out through a coaxial cable or waveguide. The spent electron beam, with reduced energy, is captured by a collector electrode. To make an oscillator, the output cavity can be coupled to the input cavity, S, with a coaxial cable or waveguide. Positive feedback excites spontaneous oscillations at the resonant frequency of the cavities. 2 Cavity Colistron Amplifier In the 2 Cavity Colistron, there are two microwave cavity resonators, the catcher, and the buncher. When used as an amplifier, the weak microwave signal to be amplified is applied to the buncher cavity through a coaxial cable or waveguide, and the amplified signal is extracted from the catcher cavity. At one end of the tube is the hot cathode heated by a filament which produces electrons. The electrons are attracted and pass through an anode cylinder at a high positive potential. These act as an electron gun to produce a high velocity stream of electrons. An external electromagnet winding creates a longitudinal magnetic field along the beam axis which prevents the beam from spreading. The beam first passes through the buncher cavity resonator through grids attached to each side. The buncher grids have an oscillating AC potential across them, produced by standing wave oscillations within the cavity, excited by the input signal at the cavity's resonant frequency applied by a coaxial cable or waveguide. The direction of the field between the grids changes twice per cycle of the input signal. Electrons entering when the entrance grid is negative and the exit grid is positive encounter an electric field in the same direction as their motion, and are accelerated by the field. Electrons entering a half cycle later, when the polarity is opposite, encounter an electric field which opposes their motion, and are decelerated. Beyond the buncher grids is a space called the drift space. This space is long enough so that the accelerated electrons catch up to the retarded electrons, forming bunches longitudinally along the beam axis. Its length is chosen to allow maximum bunching at the resonant frequency, and may be several feet long. The electrons then pass through a second cavity, called the catcher, through a similar pair of grids on each side of the cavity. The function of the catcher grids is to absorb energy from the electron beam. The bunches of electrons passing through excite standing waves in the cavity, which has the same resonant frequency as the buncher cavity. Each bunch of electrons passes between the grids at a point in the cycle when the exit grid is negative with respect to the entrance grid, so the electric field in the cavity between the grids opposes the electron's motion. The electrons thus do work on the electric field, and are decelerated, their kinetic energy is converted to electric potential energy increasing the amplitude of the oscillating electric field in the cavity. Thus the oscillating field in the catcher cavity is an amplified copy of the signal applied to the buncher cavity. The amplified signal is extracted from the catcher cavity through a coaxial cable or waveguide. After passing through the catcher and giving up its energy, the lower energy electron beam is absorbed by a collector electrode. Two cavity colistron oscillator the two-cavity colistron amplifier is readily turned into an oscillator by connecting the catcher and buncher cavities with a short coaxial cable or waveguide. The cable acts as a feedback path, applying some of the output energy to the input to provide positive feedback. This excites spontaneous oscillations in the cavities at the cavity's resonant frequency. When power to the tube is turned on, random electrical noise in the input cavity modulates the electron beam providing a signal to get oscillation started. The noise is amplified in the catcher cavity and fed back to the buncher cavity. Since the cavities have very high Q factor, only energy at the resonant frequency is amplified, so the output signal quickly becomes a sine wave. Two cavity oscillator colistrons have the advantage of being among the lowest noise microwave sources available, 
and for that reason have often been used in the illuminator systems of missile targeting radars. The two-cavity oscillator colistron normally generates more power than the reflex colistron a euro typically watts of output rather than milliwatts. Since there is no reflector, only one high voltage supply is necessary to cause the tube to oscillate, the voltage must be adjusted to a particular value. This is because the electron beam must produce the bunched electrons in the second cavity in order to generate output power. Voltage must be adjusted to vary the velocity of the electron beam to a suitable level due to the fixed physical separation between the two cavities. Often several modes of oscillation can be observed in a given colistron. Reflex colistron. In the reflex colistron, the electron beam passes through a single resonant cavity. The electrons are fired into one end of the tube by an electron gun. After passing through the resonant cavity they are reflected by a negatively charged reflector electrode for another pass through the cavity, where they are then collected. The electron beam is velocity modulated when it first passes through the cavity. The formation of electron bunches takes place in the drift space between the reflector and the cavity. The voltage on the reflector must be adjusted so that the bunching is at a maximum as the electron beam re-enters the resonant cavity, thus ensuring a maximum of energy is transferred from the electron beam to the RF oscillations in the cavity. The reflector voltage may be varied slightly from the optimum value, which results in some loss of output power, but also in a variation in frequency. This effect is used to good advantage for automatic frequency control in receivers, and in frequency modulation for transmitters. The level of modulation applied for transmission is small enough that the power output essentially remains constant. At regions far from the optimum voltage, no oscillations are obtained at all. There are often several regions of reflector voltage where the reflex colistron will oscillate. These are referred to as modes. The electronic tuning range of the reflex colistron is usually referred to as the variation in frequency between half power points a euro the points in the oscillating mode where the power outputs is half the maximum outputs in the mode. Modern semiconductor technology has effectively replaced the reflex colistron in most applications. Multicavity colistron. In all modern colistrons, the number of cavities exceeds two. A larger number of cavities may be used to increase the gain of the colistron, or to increase the bandwidth. Tuning a colistron, some colistrons have cavities that are tunable. Tuning a colistron is delicate work which, if not done properly, can cause damage to equipment or injury to the technician due to the very high voltages that could be produced. By adjusting the frequency of individual cavities, the technician can change the operating frequency, gain output power, or bandwidth of the amplifier. The technician must be careful not to exceed the limits of the graduations, or damages to the colistron can result. Manufacturers generally send a card with the unique calibrations for a colistron's performance characteristics, that lists the graduations to be set to attain any of a set of listed frequencies. No two colistrons are exactly identical, and so every card is specific to the individual unit. Colistrons have serial numbers on each of them to uniquely identify each unit, and for which manufacturers may have the performance characteristics in a database. If not, loss of the calibration card may be an economically insoluble problem, making the colistron unusable or perform marginally untuned. Other precautions taken when tuning a colistron include using non-ferrous tools. Some colistrons employ permanent magnets. If a technician uses ferrous tools and comes too close to the intense magnetic fields that contain the electron beam, such a tool can be pulled into the unit by the intense magnetic force, smashing fingers, injuring the technician, or damaging the unit. Special lightweight non-magnetic tools made of beryllium alloy have been used for tuning U.S. Air Force colistrons. Precautions are routinely taken when transporting colistron devices in aircraft, as the intense magnetic field can interfere with magnetic navigation equipment. Special overpacks are designed to help limit this field in the field, and thus allow such devices to be transported safely. Optical colistron, the technique of amplification used in the colistron is also being applied experimentally at optical frequencies in a type of laser called the free electron laser. These devices are called optical colistrons. 
instead of microwave cavities, these use devices called undulators. The electron beam passes through an undulator, in which a laser light beam causes bunching of the electrons. Then the beam passes through a second undulator, in which the electron bunches cause oscillation to create a second, more powerful light beam. Floating Drift Tube Calistron The floating drift tube calistron has a single cylindrical chamber containing an electrically isolated central tube. Electrically, this is similar to the two cavity oscillator calistron with a lot of feedback between the two cavities. Electrons exiting the source cavity are velocity modulated by the electric field as they travel through the drift tube and emerge at the destination chamber in bunches, delivering power to the oscillation in the cavity. This type of oscillator calistron has an advantage over the two cavity calistron on which it is based. It only needs one tuning element to affect changes in frequency. The drift tube is electrically insulated from the cavity walls, and DC bias is applied separately. The DC bias on the drift tube may be adjusted to alter the transit time through it, thus allowing some electronic tuning of the oscillating frequency. The amount of tuning in this manner is not large and is normally used for frequency modulation when transmitting. Collector After the RF energy has been extracted from the electron beam, the beam is destroyed in a collector. Some calistrons include depressed collectors, which recover energy from the beam before collecting the electrons increasing efficiency. Multistage depressed collectors enhance the energy recovery by sorting the electrons in energy bins. Applications Calistrons can produce far higher microwave power outputs than solid-state microwave devices such as GUN diodes. In modern systems, they are used from UHF up through hundreds of gigahertz. Calistrons can be found at work in radar, satellite and wideband high-power communication medicine, and high-energy physics. At SLAC, for example, calistrons are routinely employed which have outputs in the range of 50 MW and 50 kW at 2856 MHz. The Air Chibo planetary radar uses two calistrons that provide a total power output of 1 MW at 2380 MHz. Popular Science's Best of What's New 2007 described a company, Global Resource Corporation, currently defunct, using a calistron to convert the hydrocarbons in everyday materials, automotive waste, coal, oil shale, and oil sands into natural gas and diesel fuel. See also References External links, animation of how a calistron works, two-cavity calistron, multi-cavity calistron, reflex calistron, high power for linear accelerator, history of the calistron from Varian, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center Calistron Gallery Pictures, Calistron Collection in the Virtual Valve Museum, Calistron Amplifier, Microwave Gun Calistron developed at the SLAC.